on. Yeah. There's only one thing worse than speaking before dinner, and that's speaking when someone thought there was a pee break. <laughs> so I'm not going to be hugely offended if some of you rush out the door because I understand that you got some of it. But you know, thanks very much for taking the time. I know you're running a little bit over. Financial inclusion. It's something I personally have been very, I mean, working for and working in since 2010 as aggressively as we can. And it seems to be this ever like elusive topic. We talk about it at almost every conference. We have this conversation saying we're all investing in financial inclusion. And we say that financial inclusion is around the corner. I have been ecstatic over the last three years when I've started to unwrap this present that tokenization represents for us, almost like one of these uh, layers at a time and go down and see that actually we're getting to a stage where I think that tokenization can start solving some of these real, real financial inclusion issues. I'm going to come stand a little bit on this side, sometimes get ignored in the conflicts as we go through it. But when I, wanted, when I was asked to talk about this topic, I wanted to really understand two things. I've stood in crowds like this before and I've said that tokenization will stop it. But I went and I looked for some empirical evidence. There's a lot of statistics out here. People want to understand the research. People need to ask people. And I was so happy to find research that was published only in October this year with a deep study done across seven emerging market countries with 15,000 individuals who have started to touch crypto and blockchain and wallets and how their lives, how their lives have changed and how financial inclusion addresses it. I then went on to address a few other issues, which is, are we all on the same page what it is? I want to give you this empirical evidence. I then really want to talk about what are the profit drivers, right? Why are people going to invest in the solutions that will drive tokenization. The people in this room have to spend their time and efforts building tools which will solve for the people not in this room. And unfortunately, the only reason we'll do that is if we're going to make some kind of money from it, or we're going to make some kind of return from it, or there's going to be a profit motive for us and the user. The second thing is the user is not going to use our tools if they don't help them dramatically as they go forward. So why is it... We all talk about mobile wallets, we talk about digital payment wallets, we talk about how these, how, why have they not worked? Why hasn't Impesa taken over the world? Why hasn't a digital wallet which just addresses payments and why hasn't that taken over financial inclusion? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the global forces at play and why we can all be quite relaxed. The point start, tokenization. I want to just be quite clear in this conversation. We've got a workshop starting at 12 and we go into a whole lot more detail around we go into this, but it's not only a physical asset. We must have realized that almost anything can be tokenized. Really put these in context of saying intellectual property rights, services, leases, agreements, salaries, checks, loans. There's so much that can be tokenized. And actually the most important use case is not going to be the tokenization of something like gold or the tokenization of a building or the tokenization of of a money market fund or the tokenization of a deposit, which are all these things I'm looking at really, really hard, and a tokenization of a US dollar private credit to bring money to people. It's going to be about tokenizing the life, the things that really are difficult for people. The ability to say there's a mortgage, or I've got a salary check coming in, or I'm receiving accounts receivable are being paid to me, or I've got mobile remittances that are being paid, and I want to create a smart contract that is executable that can lend against. I want to be able to grow my wealth and services. So effectively, what you've got to make sure of in, in the financial inclusion space is, I know this used to be giving someone an account, but it's not about that anymore. It has to be about giving people the tools that empower them to grow their wealth, to participate. It doesn't help if I can move $10 if I can't make $20 or $30 as we go forward. So it's really about pursuing and bringing these parties in. So it's very important for us to understand that Although we put bank accounts out there, just because I've got an account doesn't mean I'm included in the financial system in the context of, of actually growing my wealth and growing services. So the World Bank definition, as I spoke around it, but really important, I just want to go through that point. I mean, it really has to be a broad spectrum of financial services, savings, investments, and credit. So I went on this morning onto my Valor app. I love Valor. Uh, excuse, excuse the context of the context. And I bought a perpetual future. And it took one minute, and I spent five rand on doing that. And a perpetual future is a financial product that's extremely difficult to ever buy 10 years ago, or five years ago, or three years ago without being extremely financially literate, 
and having all this private wealth accounts in the world. In the context, when we start talking about those sort of features around tokenization of those features, perpetuals on things like coin, grain, gold, commodities, oil, all of those, you have the ability to give those kind of financial leverage tools and exposure to individuals. There's a huge growth as we go into that context. Emerging markets, so this is the study that I spoke to you guys about that we found, which is amazing. So it's only published on the 17th of October. I have to give all of these details as we go through it because this is only right to give it them the credibility that they have. I'm going to talk about the main important thing that we went through today. Is the study will investigate, does cryptocurrency adoption influence the contracts like in financial inclusion, satisfaction? And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about its study, but it was extremely interesting for me to see someone go out there interview 15,000 people and see if the hypotheses were true. And the hypotheses were really sitting on the fact is that if we look at the, I'm going to try and use this point as we go through, right at the bottom here, you've got this financial inclusion. And all of the hypotheses pointed to the, this financial inclusion. And we say this at every single conference. We all sit here in our chairs and we say, we definitely got a financial inclusion. So it's okay. First one, so this is H1, and you can, cryptocurrency adoption will immediately drive financial inclusion. H2, user satisfaction does inclusion. So people have to like it. They have to grow it. They have to, it has to be perceived empowerment. It has to be trust in the financial. So all of these are a web of activities that drive financial inclusion. It's very important from a user point of view that there isn't inclusion where there isn't user satisfaction, where there isn't actually growth. We look at the points. We're going to get to this point now. 528 million people now have access to cryptocurrency assets in wallets. Whether those are hosted wallets or non-hosted wallets is the point, but still 520 million people. That number, when you look at five years, so now there must be a benefit. There's a reason they've gone through all the pain, not my, not my keys, not my wallet, they've gone through all the pain to ensure that they can have these wallets. So let's uh, see where the, where the survey went. And every single one of the hypotheses was supported from a statistic, statistical point of view. So really, really, their founding statement at the bottom, their main point was there's deep potential in emerging markets for cryptocurrencies to restructure the inefficient system and therefore do financial inclusion and instability from the base. Never, in their context, when this research came out, they never expected that every single one of the variables would be positive in the research. So all I wanted to go from this context is I'm going to talk here about about theoretical use cases. I'm going to talk about you know, where we can go with it. But statistically, through these surveys, on the ground, speaking to the lives of individuals, we can see that it really is making effect. So where we are in this context, we have it's a summary of the main, this is the main ones, gives you access. Of course, this is the most important point. Access is not only access to structured products, it's access to the community at large, it's access to credit scores, access to the service. So when we think about tokenization, don't only think about it in the context of the item. Think about it, all the data and services that go with it. The economic growth is probably one of the most important hypotheses. The, the economic growth element drove out from saying that if, if an individual has the ability to buy a hundred rands worth of stuff, or in this case, in their use case, they used the five dollar context around with emerging markets at that growth. They still operate well below the poverty line in the world that they live in. So, if you really want to include that individual, you have to be able to give them direct financial access, direct services. So, the tokenization, the fragmentation, and the ability to have any one of the assets in tokenized form definitely drove the financial inclusion in their world. So there's your empirical evidence, and your empirical evidence talks very much to that around the financial inclusion. But the next one being, what is the profit motive? So the profit motive is an interesting one. If there aren't institutions that have significant profit motive, they will not build the tools that will drive financial inclusion. So I went and I had a look at some specific data around this. And obviously, the user experience is extremely compelling for an audience on this. And I think some of the stats from the previous presenters have spoken about it, and I've got some slides here, but you all know these things. You know, transaction costing 1%, costing half a percent versus 10 remittances. We all understand the, that element of it. And I think that's why they are to, to go on to it, to get into the environment. But something else which was interesting for me, which popped up in the research, was the build cost for an FSP to launch 
a global business focusing on financial inclusion is reducing exponentially. If we go through that, if we have a look here, is for, obviously for the individual users, we can go down for cost savings from 90% of all the services, access to lending products. Effectively, you can take out a loan in 30 seconds on these platforms. You can have you know, 110% collateralized peer-to-peer -peer loans overnight. And I've got a study, which I've got a little bit of a brief that I'll give you a bit of a study over here. When they started to tokenize government grants in Brazil, they took particular communities and they started to distribute the government grants in tokenized form. They had the ability to have financial services built around that by the entrepreneurial base. The lending improved, the special improved, the retail marketing improved. All of the services around that because there was a predictability of income that was coming through the tokenized grants being deployed as they went. The individual user has significant cost benefits. And this is a, an interesting kind like how is the use case growing globally effectively? This just proves that more and more individuals are getting blockchain wallets. More and more individuals are getting access to the services that we have. The number that, the, what is the most staggering for me in this context is it's all mobile phone driven, right? We all know that eventually X will launch a wallet. Twitter, X, X will launch a wallet. We all know that Apple is going to have to start embedding a wallet. We know that Android is going to come with a wallet in it at some point. We all understand already that Telegram has got a wallet in it, got to 100 million users in, what, seven months in their services, without a significant cost of building all of this footprint around the world for people to have financial access. They've all got access in this context. Now, all of the financial service providers can sit on top of that network and access that community of people in an extremely, extremely cost-effective way. So let's talk about some of this non not burning cash anymore. And I've got some numbers up here which I have, have thought about myself these aren't all confirmed by these, these are all public, these are public knowledge, these are public research reports and how they came out. But effectively, if we have a look, look at the cost of what Telegram did, Time Bank did, and I've used Valar as an example in here as well. To build a FSP that delivers on the promise of financial inclusion, today Time Bank spent what, $260 million in its public rounds. It's grown its customer base significantly. It grew it to 7 million. And these are, this is just newspaper articles that are out now. That's still a significant amount of money that the investors require to build a financial service provider that has its goal, financial inclusion. Velo, in the same context, raised, has raised 55 million. They've received a million clients and they're achieving their goal of financial inclusion to their user base with a significantly less investment in infrastructure. You go to the next one down the line, you go to Telegram, yes, they spent a huge amount of money on some other completely different business case, but they can launch a wallet and launch a financial services business within their business for a fraction of the cost with both of those, so even less than potentially launching an exchange. Their partnership with Tether is just an extremely important way of them launching all of these services out into the marketplace. So when you've got these main global forces at play, when you've got forces of users desperate for the service, You've got institutions that are making it so much easier for them to deploy services onto this. We're going to see a rapid increase in the financial inclusion due to one fundamental factor, and that is tokenization. Because tokenization of real world assets is still a context. Yes, on those tools, they will be able to buy crypto assets. Yes, they will be able to invest, speculate, do whatever you guys want to call it around the, just the assets that are here. But they will also be able to access gold, access loans, financing, uh, yield-bearing products, stablecoin, investment services. And those are the ones that traditionally have been extremely difficult. They'll then be able to access what we all think are the most important ones for wealth creation. Fractionalized, partly leveraged investments in real estate, in derivative products which have gearing inside of them, which never were available to people who were not necessarily have a wealth advisor or advisor. The ability to do two things as well, I'm going to get into a topic as we go to the next slides, but the ability for them effectively to have a look at why mobile money hasn't in our minds sold financial inclusion. It hasn't been able to deliver the rest of the value added financial services products on top of it. And it is operating in silos, it hasn't been able to give interoperability, it hasn't been able to 
to bring all of the banking regulatory services that we can start bringing into the products and into the hands so we have to go through it. So just have a look at this um, from a government grant point of view because I wanted to take you through this particular use case because it's very relevant. I think it's extremely relevant in the South African context. I think it's extremely relevant. If we consider how many people are receiving government grants in South Africa, and if we think about the fact that this particular program which was run, we we'll go through it, they, so, sorry, that's the next slide, government grant slide, I can see the, the, the slides here. So if we go forward, and what we ultimately have in the money that we have, once something is tokenized, is all of the features that get enabled by this tokenization through the programmable features, the auditing, the incentives, the rewards, the interoperability, and the microcredit capabilities. We all know these, these are the standard ones that come up, but the use cases that I want to talk about specifically are use cases around a, a case study which is done in Brazil. It's called Palmas, P-A-L-M-A-S. I think the slide is on in here. So what they started to do was distribute in a stable coin, effectively they call it the Palmas, they started delivering the government grant in this currency and it was spent at a certain stores, certain environments and offered for redemption at certain environments. The redemption had a penalty associated with it. If you redeemed for cash, it had a certain penalty associated with it. But in an overnight, they managed to move all of the population who were receiving these grants. All of this population were able to eliminate all of the microcredit that they were using. When I talk about all the microcredit, you might say, why? Because effectively, we could use, or they could use smart contracts that knew that there was government grant tokens being paid into these wallets. These wallets were therefore effectively having government-based risk. The risk was that the government wasn't going to pay the grant into these processes. That was effectively the smart contract could then, the loans that could come from a DeFi pool would take government risk on them. Effectively, what you've got here is you've got government-backed lending, effectively, but an individual is able to leverage off the credibility of the government grant program. So the lending rates dropped 85% to those individuals. So they went from basically unsustainable microcredit services all the way to highly sustainable micro-lending based on the fact that the grant program was tokenized and they managed to deliver it into a service. So I guess where I'm going to go from this, these global forces that are at play is that there's a huge network effect taking place. Every single one of us are developing tokens faster and more, these tokens are more liquid, they're more integrated, they're more flexible. The economic incentives are unbelievable. The efficiencies for both FSPs, the efficiencies for customers, the efficiency for retail networks, the tech process, which, which was spoken about earlier, is just relentless in terms of the, of the modifications you've got. And the shift in control, in other words, tokenization actually brings control to individuals. When you've got all of these global forces, it means that there is, there is the water is flowing, the, the floodgates have opened, and everybody is working to one goal. Give a retail customer a, a wallet, pull all the services on top of it, be able to tokenize the financial aspects into it, and everybody has a deep profit motive to go forward. So really, in summary, for me, it's tokenization is no longer just this niche idea. It's not something which is out there that's reserved to a stable coin only. It's not reserved to a tokenized deposit. The abilities that we see to tokenize amazingly creative, highly, highly positive features for financial inclusion is coming through. And those who adopt early stand to have and to lead the way in what we think is probably the biggest global financial inclusion revolution. I think it's really important to really have that goal. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And you're right off to your breaks, eh? <laughs>